begin. So today I'll try and start discussing loop amplitudes. Okay. I'll of course set up the general formalism of how to derive Feynman rules. But uh, we'll see that there is some special features of the loop amplitudes which have to be understood before we can actually evaluate. And the special feature that you have to understand is the following. So as you saw, if you have a loop diagram, typically you are left with a momentum integration. Okay, because some of the momentum, loop momentum, are not fixed by delta function, uh, the momentum conservation laws. And what can happen is that those momentum integrals can become divergent. So take, for example, a graph like this, okay, in phi 4 theory. Where say we have v1, v2, v3, v4. And we have an undetermined momentum L. Okay, once this is L, then this is of course fixed to be minus v1, minus v2. because here it's like p1 plus p2 coming out of this. Okay, so total momentum coming out should be minus p1 minus p2 and I have just divided it into L and minus p1 minus p2 minus L. So this one has, is proportional to an integral of the following form. We have v4 L over 2 pi to the 4 1 over L squared plus M squared minus i epsilon and p1 plus p2 plus l squared plus m squared. Okay, I have ignored minus signs and i's etc. which are all outside. Okay, so this is potentially different kinds of divergences. One possible source of divergence is when the denominator vanishes. Those are of course controlled by this i epsilon. As long as epsilon is non-zero, the denominator never vanishes because you are taking the integral and the real axis. But we have to worry about whether they eventually uh, remain finite when you take the epsilon goes to zero. And in spatial cases, one finds that they can become divergent when the epsilon goes to zero limit. But those are not the kinds of divergences we will worry about. So the divergences of denominators <coughs> of denominators these can lead to singularities. But typically the reason that you don't worry about this is because these singularities turn out to be have physical origin. It never happens that, well, I will not say it never happens. If there are no massless particles, then it never happens that these are actually infinite. But what can happen is that the integral becomes infinite. And then you have to worry about how the integral can be uh, finite. And when there are no massless particles, one can show that the integral never becomes infinite because the integral always remains finite. So these can give rise to singularities of the amplitudes, but they are integral singularities. But these are not what we will worry about right now. Our worry will be what happens for large L. So we will worry about divergences. for large L. <coughs> large L means large loop momentum. So these are called ultraviolet divergences. Ultraviolet. The ultraviolet are in short two. So in this example, 
if we take L to be large, then in the large L limit, you can ignore this m square factors, you can ignore the pure square three two factors. So this integral for large L, large L, goes as integral d4 L over L square whole square. Okay, because I just replace this by L square and this also by L square because L is larger than the fixed momentum of the star. And this is logarithmic diagram. Okay, to see this, what we can do is that we can, here L square of course is minus L zero square plus L square. But we will make a Euclidean rotation. Okay, we will write L zero as I times the L4. And write this as integral d 4 L over L1 square plus L4 square whole square. Okay, it is to estimate the whether it is divergent or not. And now what we can do is that we can change variables change variables we define r as square root of l1 square plus l2 square plus l3 square plus l4 square okay this is the analog of the radial distance but in four dimensions okay now all of these dimensions are um, space dimensions because i have made this change L0 goes to I times L4. So in this case, see this is a form in which the integral would have arisen anyway if you had started from the Euclidean uh, formalism, right? I gave the path integral, one of to define the path integral as I described was to define it fully in the Euclidean space, right? In, if you had defined it fully in the Euclidean space, then the momentum would have been Euclidean anyway. Okay, and then we got the uh, got this form by uh, uh, so now we are saying let's go back to the original Euclidean formulation. In this case, the integrals are like this. So if you make this change of variables, then this integral goes as integral r to the power d minus uh, r cube dr omega 3 over r square whole square. What is omega 3? This is the Volume of three square, volume of unit three square. Is this familiar? Right? The volume element, right? if you go to the polar coordinates, can be thought of as this R cube dr. Okay, this is the generalization of what we are already familiar with in two and three dimensions. Right? Suppose you have a two dimensional integral, dx dy. That can be written as integral dr times 2 pi, right? because 2 pi is the length of the unit circle. Right? In three dimensions, okay, integral dx dy dz, I can write as r square dr okay, times the volume of the two dimensional sphere, which is 4 pi, right? 4 pi r square dr. This is the generalization of that in one higher dimension. Okay? And in fact, omega 3, there is a formula for omega 3, this is 2 pi square. Okay, a three dimensional sphere has area, unit three dimensional sphere has area 2 pi square. Okay, if you have not done this before, I will leave it as an exercise to do this. And you can take a three dimensional sphere, take x, y, z, w, write a surface x square plus y square plus z square plus w square equal to 1 and try to calculate its volume. And then you will find that this is 2 pi square. Okay, the details are not important, but what is important is that the, if you look at the power of R, we have R cube and R to the 4, so this goes as integral dr over R. And of course, you shouldn't trust it for small r, right? because for small r, there are various corrections which I have ignored. But you see that for large r, it goes as dr over R, okay? and hence it's logarithmic and diverge. If you take the upper limit to be lambda, this goes as log lambda, and that goes to infinity when lambda goes to infinity. Right? If you take the upper limit to be lambda, this goes as log lambda, and that goes to infinity when lambda goes to infinity. Right? 
connect this to the lambda. This goes as log lambda, and this goes to infinity as lambda goes to infinity. Is this point clear? <coughs> so you see that this integral is logarithmical diagonal. And in this case, you can show that for generic values of the external momentum, this is the only kind of divergence that we have found. Okay, the divergences are coming from the zeros of this. Okay, as I said, sometimes you may get divergences from here, but they are not very serious. Typically, they are always integral divergences. Just to convince you, let me do this once anyway, to show that these divergences are not too problematic. So let's look at where the poles are in the denominator, right? Where the denominator can vanish. And we look at it as a function of f. So this is real L0 and this is imaginary L0. This one has zeros at L0 square minus plus L square. L square equal to 0, which gives L0 equal to plus minus square root of L square plus L square. Right? So, uh, we were not taking the i epsilon. Okay, let's put the i epsilon minus i epsilon equal to 0 minus i epsilon. So, those are here and here. has at minus q1 0 minus q2 0 plus minus square root of q1 plus q2 plus a square plus m square so those will be like say here But typically what can happen, what you can do is that you can deform the contour so as to remain far away from these poles. Because contour I mean contour integral, as long as the endpoints are fixed, you can deform the contour in any way you like. Okay. So you can deform the contour to move these far away from the poles and avoid the poles that okay. Sometimes you may get singularities when these poles approach each other. Right? Suppose the two poles so the positions of the poles depend on these variables, right? So sometimes it may happen that the two poles approach each other from opposite sides, and you cannot deform the contour away from those poles. Okay, and that's the place where you actually get singularities of these integrals. But those singularities, as I said, can all be integral, right? The integral may be singular, it's like integral dx over root x. Right? The integral is divergent at x equal to zero. But the integral is not divergent, right? It's integrable. So the kind of singularity that you may get possibly from the poles approaching each other, you can show all integrable. Okay, as long as there are no massless particles. So these are not the poles that we'll be worried about, right? Our main worry will be the divergence of this kind. Okay, coming from large values of momentum. Now, I gave you one, one diagram where these divergences appear, but in, these are in fact very generic. Okay, there are many diagrams which can give rise to divergences. So let me write another diagram. Sir, what is the continuum of poles? See, in any finite order in perturbation theory, you never have continuum of poles, right? You always have a finite number of poles because there are after a finite number of denominators. So you don't encounter the problem of continuum of poles. The divergences come when the poles approach each other. Right? That's that's what the problem comes from. 
Well, eventually you have to take the epsilon goes to zero limit, right? So the question is when the epsilon goes to zero limit, yes. So you can do the integral keeping the epsilon phi, right? But the question is as you take the epsilon goes to zero limit at the end, do you get infinite answer or finite answer? And what you can show that in four dimensions, as long as there are no massless particles, you always get uh, finite answers. If there are massless particles, then sometimes you have divergences, and then you have to worry about how to deal with those. Okay, these are called infrared divergences, but those are not the ones that are we are going to bother about right now. Okay, just assume that all particles are massive for now, and proceed. Four and less damage. You can see that the ultraviolet divergences become worse as you go to higher end dimension, right? Because you, this this part starts increasing. Whereas the infrared divergences become worse as you go to lower dimension, because this part starts decreasing. So the small L region can have a large numerator, and the numerator doesn't blow go down sufficiently fast to compensate for it. So infrared divergences are problematic in lower dimension, ultraviolet divergences are problematic in higher dimension. In four dimensions, you have both kinds in general, and you have to deal with those, but separately. Again, in five to the fourth theory, this diagram is it divergent or not divergent? We are talking about ultraviolet. This is like if this is L, right? So P1, P1. This is integral d4 L over L2. <laughs> So if you again change variables, this goes as integral r cube dr omega 3 over r square. Okay, to the upper limit lambda. So this is a clearly divergent, right? Integral r dr. So this goes as lambda square. Loop diagrams are divergent. Okay, one can write down loop examples of loop diagrams which are convergent. And here is one of them. You take again in five fourth theory. Okay, if you have a diagram like this, suppose this is L. So this will be L plus something, and this will be L plus something, right? That something is whatever momentum is entering from here. But if you look at the large L limit, then this goes as d4L over L square cube. Yeah, because this is giving an L square in the numerator, this is giving an L square, this is giving an L square. So this is finite. Right? Because this will go as integral r cube dr omega 3 over r square whole square, r square cube. So this goes as like dr over r cube. This is R cube versus R to the six. So this goes as dr over R cube. So this is finite, right? There is no divergence from the upper end. Is it clear? The lower end you shouldn't worry about because this is the fact that it's R cube. We have already made an approximation that R is large. Okay, because lower end there are various momentum. Factors, mass factors, which will cut off the lower So this is not divergent. So this is divergent. This is finite. This is divergent. And you can discuss this also for higher dimensions. Okay, they are uh, similarly finite diagrams and divergent.
So the renormalization is the program that tries to make sense of these divergences. Okay? Even though there are divergences, we are going to use quantum field theory for physical amplitudes. Okay? We have to know how to get extra finite answers from these diverging diagrams. And this program is what we normally call renormalization. Okay? That how can we make sense of these divergences? Renormalization and so this program has two main steps. The first step is to introduce what is called a regularization. Regularization. The simplest cutoff that you have is to take each momentum and put the upper limit of the momentum integral not from minus infinity to infinity but from minus lambda to lambda. Okay. Then, of course, everything is finite. So, take simplest possibility. Take L mu with lambda and minus lambda for all moments. Now, this is not a very uh, systematic cutout because it has many problems. Okay? It has problems that, first of all, it's not Lorentz invariant. If you take L mu, and make a Lorentz transformation, okay? the cutoff changes. Okay? So this is not Lorentz invariant. This depends on how you label the loop momentum. Right? For example, here I took this momentum to be L, this is L plus something, this is L plus something. Right? I could have taken this to be L, okay? this to be L plus something, this to be L plus something. Right? Putting the restriction on this momentum, that kind of restriction, and putting the restriction on this momentum gives different results. Is that clear? Because effectively, suppose this is one way of labeling, right? But I could have also labeled it like this. This is L. Okay, so let's maybe write some of it. So this is P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. Okay? P1, P2. So if you call this L, then this becomes L minus P3 minus P3. And this becomes L plus P1 plus P3. Okay, these are all going out. But the same diagram. Suppose you call this momentum L, then this becomes L plus P5 plus P6. And this becomes L minus P3 minus P6. Same diagram. It has different to our level. So if you say that you will restrict each component of L mu between minus lambda and lambda. That restrictions gives you certain restriction on the loop momentum here. But if you use this L and put the same restriction, that's a different restriction here, right? Because this L is related to this L by L minus P3 minus P4 here being the L here. So if you restrict this L to go from minus and lambda to lambda, this L effectively goes from in some other range. 
So it's not even invariant. So this kind of cutoff is not even invariant under relabeling of the loop moment. But I just give you an exa example. Okay, there are other more sophisticated versions of the cutoffs which we'll be discussing later. Okay. But the first step is to make it finite somehow okay, by putting a cutoff. Okay. Result may depend on how you have cut it off. Final result will can will cert certainly diverge if you take lambda goes to infinity. Okay, if this is the only thing that you do. But you do something to make it finite first. Okay, because if you don't make it finite, then you cannot really proceed, right? Because you cannot manipulate infinite quantity. Right? You have to have some way to make things finite. Are there any questions? So, as I said, these are very crude versions of regularization. We will discuss a more sophisticated version of regularization. But the basic idea is that we introduce some parameter such that as long as that parameter is kept finite, the results are finite. Eventually, you want to take the parameter to infinity, okay? which is the analog of the lambda. Okay? Because you really don't want to put a cutoff at the end. step 2, which is the non-trivial part, this can be stated in many different ways. Okay, so I'll do it in two different ways now, and then later on we'll see it even a third way. So suppose we have made this finite. We have expressed all S matrix elements, which are the physical quantities, in terms of the various parameters of the theory. So these relations, S matrix as a function of the parameters, if we now keep the parameters fixed and take the cutoff to infinity, the S matrix will become infinite. Because after all, the initial S matrix are divergent, right? So if you take the cutoff to infinity, S matrix will become infinite. But now we use the fact that the parameters of the theory okay, that we have introduced, they are not directly measurable. We want to find something that is testable. Okay? We want to find some testable predictions of the theory which you can measure in experiment. Okay? S matrix is something you can measure. Okay? Or more precisely, the mod square of the S matrix is something you can measure. But the parameters m and lambda, which are in the 5 fourth theory, those you cannot measure. Okay? We can measure them if we can relate somehow m to the mass of the particle. Okay? But Mass of the particle is coming from the poles, so the two-point function, right? Let's suppose that we don't know the relationship between them and the poles. So parameters are not physical. So what we can try to do is to detect many different S matrix elements, which may also contain two-point function. And then we eliminate those parameters, which are only a finite in number, right? M and lambda for five fourth here. So we eliminate this parameter and find relationship between different S matrix. This clear? So the S matrix elements, S matrix are functions of parameters. M lambda. So we eliminate M lambda and write down. Maybe I can just say instead of S matrix element, observables. So the physical mass of the particle is also an observable. Well, it may be more complicated. Okay. So you eliminate, so take two particular observables, which are given in terms of M and 
lambda. Use those to write a man lambda in terms of the observables. This you can do because everything is being done at finite lambda, that right? cutoff of kept finite. So observable a man lambda can be expressed in terms of the observables. Now take a third observable, which you know in terms of a man lambda. But a man lambda has been expressed in terms of two other observables. So express a third observable in terms of these two observables. Is that point clear? Now, a man lambda are not the identical. Okay, it's a relation between relationship that tells us one observable in terms of two others. All calculated from this theory, right? Except that the original parameters a man lambda are not there in the final relation that we are using. Now there is no escape, right? Now everything is an observable, right? So now we can ask: Is this relation okay, observable a? given as a function of observable to b and observable c. Now you take lambda goes to infinity, take the cutoff to infinity in this relation. You can ask, is this generating a finite relation? Does this relation remain finite as lambda goes to infinity? Is this clear? Okay. We are not asking if observable c Given in terms of a and lambda, remain finite as lambda goes to infinity. But we are asking if observable c, given as a function of two other observables, a and b, remain finite as lambda goes to infinity. So, is that true that when we have to take lambda going to infinity, or that relation should be independent of lambda? Well, yeah, no, you have to take lambda goes to infinity. For finite lambda, in general, that relation may not be independent of lambda. Right? There will be correct terms of order 1 over lambda, 1 over lambda square, right? which will all go to 0 as lambda goes to infinity. And in general, it is not true that the relation will be dependent on lambda. Sir, these observables are like physical mass or something? Yes, one observable could be physical mass. Right? So instead of, so you calculate the physical mass by looking at a poles in the two quant function as a function of m. It will have the structure that the leading contribution, of course, will be m. Right? But that at one loop it will get some corrections. Right? At two loop it will get some corrections. So the physical mass will be given m plus some corrections, which will be which in general divergent as lambda goes to infinity. Right? But you work at finite lambda. Use that to write physical, write m in terms of physical mass. Instead of thinking of this physical mass being given as a function of m, you invert that to write m as a function of physical mass. Right? So that will also have the structure that to first leading order, m is equal to physical mass, and then there are corrections. Those relations are also divergent. Okay, as you take lambda goes to infinity, in general they are divergent. But now you calculate another observable. And similarly, you calculate, say, physical pole point coupling. Okay, that's given as a function of lambda okay, and m. Okay, the leading contribution to the physical pole point coupling is just lambda itself, right? Because the three level diagram for pole point scattering is just this one. Okay, so it's equal to lambda. But then at hard loop, there are corrections, right? So the physical pole point coupling is a function of lambda, okay, which begins at lambda, then the order. The, the lambda corrections yeah. and so on. To invert this to write lambda as a function of physical pole point coupling. Now you take a third observable, say five point scattering. We know its expression in terms of m and lambda, right? But from a specific time and diagram calculation. But we also know what m is in terms of physical mass and lambda uh, and physical coupling, and we also know what lambda is in terms of physical mass and physical. So eliminate a and lambda okay, and write the say this third observable, which is the five point scattering, in terms of the physical mass and physical four point scattering. Now you can ask, is this relation finite as lambda goes to infinity? Is this clear? Okay, this is a question that is different from asking whether the five point scattering expressed in terms of a and lambda finite as lambda goes to infinity. No, no, they are different, yeah. So cut off will make, if that confuses you, let me put capital M. Okay, this is some big vast cut off, yeah. So the coupling lambda has nothing to do with this lambda. Okay, it will be what? There will be two epsilon. So I, I, I mean, it's good that you start getting used to two symbols of the same name. Okay, so is this clear? 
Or M goes to infinity because ultimately the original theory didn't have the same, right? You are integrating L mu from minus m to the infinity. So eventually to get a sensible theory, you have to take the N goes to infinity. Right? So the point is that a physical a physical observable, so observable C. Observable C. is equal to some function of observable A, which could be the physical mass, observable B, B, which could be the physical four-point sampling from the S matrix, and M. M has appeared because M has, uh, all integrals are defined with this kind of, right? So now we are asking that if you will take this function and take m to infinity, okay. does this generate a finite function or not? If this generates a finite function, we call the theory normalizable. If this function is not finite as capital M goes to infinity, then the theory is not renormalizable. Okay? So this is a distinction between a renormalizable theory and a non-renormalizable theory. So take m goes to infinity, If f is finite in this limit, then the theory is Yes, because that's, that's the Feynman diagram calculation will give you the third, third observable as a function of a man la, the mass and the lambda and this capital M, okay, which is a cutoff. Okay, again, there are two uh, names uh, which are the same, right? M, there is a small m for the mass, right? <laughs> mass parameter and capital M for the cutoff, okay? So, whatever it is, uh, this is this thing, right? This is just a cutoff parameter. So now we eliminate the mass parameter and the coupling parameter in terms of physical observables, which are observables A and B. Okay, so it could be the physical masses and physical four-point coupling, but it could, it could be anything else. Take any two observables and write an relation like this. And now you take the cutoff to infinity. Okay, and ask if this is a finite. See, you don't ask what happens for A and B, no? because once you have eliminated, A and B are now independent parameters. You see, A and B are functions of the mass parameter and lambda, right? We have now ex expressed the mass parameter and lambda in terms of A and B, right? So now A and B are our arbitrary parameters, right? These, these, are, these are measured in experiment, okay? So experiments, of course, don't care about any cutoff, right? Experiments give you the value of A and B, A and B okay, which of course have to be finite because experiments don't measure infinite quantities, right? So you measure them experimentally. Those are your parameters in terms of which you are trying to express everything. Theory gives you the observable C as a function of observable A and observable B. As far as the theory is concerned, these are independent quantities now, right? Because these are given as a functions of small m and uh, small lambda. But those small m and small lambda now have been eliminated in terms of these, right? So instead of thinking of small n and m and small lambda as independent quantities, we think of these as independent quantities as far as the theory is concerned. So now, when you take capital M to infinity, we give these things. Because these are now our independent parameters, right? We give these things and take capital M to infinity. Okay, because theory, is telling us that eventually you have to take capital M to infinity, right? You don't really have a uh, physical cutoff in uh, nature. At the same time, theorists know that these are observables, so these you can actually measure in experiment. So these you think of as independent parameters, right? 
which the experiments will uh, give you. And now we want to see if this relationship remains finite as capital M goes to infinity. Well, of course, there are infinite number of observables, right? But you need two to eliminate two parameters. For five to four theory, because you have two parameters, m and lambda, small m and small lambda, right? You use two observables, any two, to eliminate small m and small lambda, right? And write every other observable in terms of those two. Is this clear? This has to be done order by order. Yes. So this has to be done order by order in part right? Everything you have to be saying, okay, you go up to a given order in part version theory, and then you carry out this procedure. Okay? So when you say that we invert the relationship between small m and small lambda, which are the parameters, and the observables a and b, you do this, you do this inversion in a part version expansion. Capital M, yes. If the theory is sensible, it shouldn't. No, no. Because the point is the calculation, you have put this M as a cutoff, right? So you have changed your theory. See, once you have a cutoff, you have changed your theory, right? Only in the M goes to infinity limit you can hope that you will recover a cutoff independent story, right? See, if you have, if you are defining your momentum integrals by putting this cutoff, then of course things will depend on M, right? Because you are saying that the loop momentum cannot become larger than M. That's not the theory we started with, right? You have introduced this cutoff M by hand. So now everything that the theory calculates could depend on small capital M. But the real question is whether you can now take capital M to infinity and recover a sensible capital M independent tax. If the expression contains divergent pieces as capital M goes to infinity, then you don't get a sensible answer, right? So this is the key issue that whether these relations of this kind that you write have a sensible limit as capital M goes to infinity. The fact that it depends on capital M shouldn't be a surprise at all because you have introduced capital M as a parameter in the intermediate stage of the analysis, right? So only in the capital M goes to infinity limit you can hope to get an answer that is finite and it may be If this result, for example, contains a term proportion of log M, log of capital M, then as capital M goes to infinity, it doesn't really go to a finite value, right? Then the theory is not normalized. Okay. Up to a given order. You can show that, I mean, as long as it's true to any given order in part of theory, then you'll say that theory is normalizable. Well, it doesn't say anything about whether the sum is UV finite or not. Okay, that's a refund issue altogether. So the sum converges or not, that, that question in normalization doesn't matter. Okay. Normalization is that you fix a given order in part version theory, it doesn't matter, 100th order in part version theory, and you should be able to prove that to add that order in part version theory, you can get a sensible relationship of this kind after you take the end goes Now, if you really think about it this way, then it would seem surprising that there is any normalizable theory at all. And the reason is that there are infinite number of observables. Right? The theory has infinite number of S matrix elements. Right? You can put arbitrary number of external particles, arbitrary momentum that they carry. Right? Continuum family, continuous family of observables. Right? For generic momentum, generic external particles. And for a theory to be denormalizable, all of these relations, all of these observables, you can express in terms of these two observables, right? And M. All of these functions have to be finite as capital M goes to infinity. Not one function or two functions. Yeah. 
is this point here. So every function that you have that relates observables, okay, one observable in terms of uh, others, right? Two are, in, the, in the case of high four theory, there are two other observables. One observable in terms of two other observables. Okay. Every relation of this kind okay, should have a finite limit as capital M goes to. How, yeah, but I will check. We'll, that's what you have to learn. Right? How we check that? Right? So how do you prove that theory is renormalizable? Right? So we'll see how exactly this is done. Well, you can change the observable to observable one in terms of two observables. Yes. Yes. I'm going to give a slightly different view of renormalization, okay, which is equivalent to what I used here. And in this different view of, see here, in this way of describing it, okay, I gave some special treatment to these. Okay. We eliminated A and lambda in terms of some two uh, observables, and then I express everything in terms of these. Okay. I don't want to give any pre special uh, preference to any part of the observable. Okay, so let's see if we can get around that. So again, let's work in the context of high four theory, but this is general. So I have any observable, let's see A, as some function, F, let's call it F, A, of M, lambda, and capital lambda, capital, capital lambda, which is a cut. Okay, this is a cut. And our problem is that if we keep m and lambda fixed and take capital M to infinity, then this function is diverging. That's the meaning of the original expression being ultraviolet diverging. Okay? And if we keep these parameters fixed, okay, then cutoff cannot be taken to infinity. But now we ask a slightly different question. Okay? Again, that is that relies on the fact that these are not physical quantities. Okay, these are some parameters that you have written in the Lagrangian. Experimentalists don't measure these directly. Okay. Experimentalists only measure the S matrix, other observables. So we ask the question, is it possible? Is it possible to find some functions? <coughs> so f1 of x and y and f2. So maybe I shouldn't call it x and y, let's call this a and b, and f2 of a and b, such that these are a, b, and lambda. Okay, this is a bit more a bit more abstract than what I described last time, but this has a entirely exactly the same content. Okay, so I'll try to explain why this is a question. Is that AB are new parameters? Yes, AB are new parameters. So what is this saying? This is saying that the problem was that M and lambda are not physical parameters, right? So if we keep M and lambda fixed and take capital M P infinity, then you're running into problems. 
But nobody tells us that as you take capital M to infinity, M and lambda should be kept fixed. Right? I can take M and lambda also to go to infinity and cancel of the infinities that are coming from capital M. What are you losing? We are losing that we are encountering the fact that the parameters in Lagrangian, M and lambda, they are infinite. But we don't care about the parameters that we introduce in Lagrangian range, right? As long as the S matrix elements are all finite, we are okay. So you now try to postulate that M and lambda are given by some two new parameters, A and B. Okay, we are trading in equal number of parameters, we are not introducing new parameters. But the relationship between M and lambda and A and B depends on capital M. Okay, capital M is a fake parameter which has to be set to take it to infinity at the end. So this is what is meant. Instead of m, we think of this as some function of a, b, and m, and replace lambda by some function of a, b, and m. Okay. These will take to be finite parameters. And then we'll try to, we have not said what f1 and f2 are, right? So we'll try to choose our f1 and f2 in such a way that as capital M goes to infinity, this function f a, this goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, as capital M goes to infinity. M, of course, also goes to infinity. However, this function remains finite as capital M goes to infinity. F1, F2, do they also go to infinity? Yes, F1, F2 will go to infinity. If you keep A and B fixed and take capital M to infinity, see, unless you go to, or take this to infinity, go to infinity, then you cannot cancel the divergences that was there against anything, right? We are basically cancelling the original divergence that was there because m was going to infinity. Right? If there are some log m term right, in this, we have to cancel it off by some minus log m term coming from here. So if this can be done, then this means what? This means that we can now think of a and b as our independent parameters. When you write the Lagrangian, it's a function of the fields. And instead of writing m phi square, we'll be writing f1 a b m phi square. Okay, where a and b are some parameters. m is some fake parameter that I have introduced in the diagram. Okay, it will also be introduced in the on the momentum part. And same is true for the lambda phi four part. Right, instead of writing lambda phi four, I'll write f2 a b m times phi four. We don't think of A and B as independent parameters. We are not changing the number of independent parameters. Okay, two versus two. And then the question is, we calculate now an S matrix element, F A, okay, which will be given as a function of A and B. Now you take M to infinity. If this function can be made finite, then we are done. Why are you done? Because then this means that when you calculate any S matrix element as a function of A and B, they are finite as m goes to infinity. Now, if you want to do this, you just have to eliminate a and b, okay? take two S matrix elements which are given as a function of a and b, it's a finite function, just eliminate a and b, and then you can express third observable in terms of the two other observables. But if these functions are finite to begin with, then this elimination process is not going to give you divergence, any new divergence, right? Because if every observable expresses a function of small a and small b are finite functions, then when we eliminate small a and small b to write a third observable in terms of the two of first observables, that will also be a finite function. So if this can be done, then this is guaranteed. Is this clear? The other one is also true. If this can be done, this is guaranteed because you can just take a to be observable capital A and B, the small param the parameter B to the observable B. And then we have what we have here. So these two are equivalent ways of describing renormalizability of the theory. This has the advantage that we don't have to give any special preference to any particular observable. Then we simply demand that it is, is it possible to postulate some relation that expresses the parameters, small m and small lambda, as functions of new parameters, okay, but those functions themselves can diverge in the m goes to infinity limit. But 
what you gain is that that divergence can be used to cancel the divergence that was there if you have kept this fixed and taken the capital as well. Small lambda, yes. Well, we will see that again. The way we will organize our perturbation expansion is that these divergences will always be high part, high part of the coupling cost. Okay. So, if there is a relationship of the form lambda equal to a plus say a square log m, a is sorry, so let's call it b. So to, at three level, right, you can make these parameters a and b in such a way that at the three level, okay, small m is equal to a and uh, lambda is equal to b. Right? So at three level, there's no divergence anywhere. Right? So this was you can uh, think of this as a perturbation expansion. Okay? Then when you eliminate b in terms of lambda, right, we will write this as b equal to lambda minus lambda square log. We'll do it in more detail say that. So it will not be so the fact that this is divergent, right? It doesn't prevent us from doing a perturbation expansion of this guy. This is okay. So we'll first do the perturbation expansion in the small parameter lambda or the uh, small parameter b. Okay. And then to any given order in perturbation theory, we'll see the divergence like that. So it's not that because this is large, we gotta do a perturbation expansion in B. Okay, because the perturbation expansion in B will be done first. Okay. Then we'll take the capital M goes to infinity as well. Uh, yes. Exactly. So B will B will be have small values here. No, it is guaranteed because you will always take a b goes to zero limit oh. first before taking the m goes to infinity. Right? So the perturbation expansion will always be done in, the, in terms of b first. Right? So that will be the renormation program that the perturbation expansion is done first. Okay. Then we worry about cap taking capital m to infinity. Okay, the cut off to infinity. Okay, but this will become clear once I you know, do some examples. Question. This is the basic philosophy here. What we are going to do. So now I'll focus on first finding regulator. As I said, this regulator, of course, any regulator in principle could work. But having a cutoff like minus m to m is not a very good uh, way of regularizing the theory. There are better ways, okay, and I'll describe. Some regulation, regularization that will be So the regularization that we'll be using is what is called dimensional regularization. Let me remind you again that what was the purpose of regularization. The purpose of regularization was to first make the integrals finite. We make the integrals finite by putting some kind of cutoff, then do our manipulations. And after you have expressed m and lambda in terms of finite parameters, and then 
At the end, we take the regulator to engage. Okay, that was the goal. So first, the <coughs> job of the regulator to give will be to give high rank result for every uh, quantity. Okay, even if it doesn't make sense okay, physically, so we want a finite result. So this dimensional regularization does that by working in dimensions other than four. As we saw, the ultraviolet divergences are dimension sensitive. Okay. Lower the dimension, the better the behavior of the integer. Okay. Because it's simply because you are integrating over a less number of variables. So in dimensional regularization, what we do is that we work in low dimensions to define the integer. And then we define the integrals in four dimensions by analytic configuration. Now this is a little strange because normally when you talk about analytic continuation, right, you describe it as a function of a continuous variable. Right? If a function, what is the role of analytic, what is the meaning of analytic continuation? If you have a complex, a function of a complex variable, an analytic function, if you know the function over any line segment, then you can Define it everywhere in the complex plane. Right? That's the meaning of analytic continuation. <coughs> but when you're talking about dimensions, they are integers. Okay? They are not continuous variables. So if we have an integral, we can define it as some discrete number of dimensions which are lower than four. Okay, depending on what the integral was to begin with. Say three, two, and one. Possibly zero. But the question is, how do you analytically continue a function if you know this value only at 0, 1, 2, and 3? Okay. So you have to find some tricks, right? And that's what dimension regularization allows us to do, right? It turns out that even though actual physical integrals make sense only in integer dimensions, there is a way in which you can define this integral at arbitrary dimension for thinking of dimension as a continuous variable. So you'll see how <coughs> that is done. So once we understand that, then we'll carry out all our manipulations at this arbitrary continuous dimension. Okay, formula will make sense, okay, even though they do not make sense physically. We'll carry out this program okay, by expressing everything in terms of some other parameters, A and B. Okay, the M and lambda in terms of A and B. The role of M will be played by D, the dimension of space time that you're working. After you have calculated this, okay, and express the physical observables in terms of A and B, then we'll take D goes to four limit. And we'll try to see that in the D goes to four limit, all divergences cancel. Okay, but the D goes to four limit will be taken at the end of the calculation after you have eliminated the original parameters, M and lambda, in terms of the new parameters here. Okay, if we express in terms of the original parameters, so what are this level? And Take D goes to 4, these results will be diverged, right? which is uh, expected because how many the original results are ultra diverged. Is this clear? So let's see how we can make sense of integrals as a function of dimension. So we'll start with a simple integral because this will basically capture most of what you want to do, ddk over k squared plus two pi to the d. Is the limit of k we can? Limit of k? No, <coughs> we are not going to put any capital M now. Minus infinity infinity. So you are going to do the make this finite not by putting a cutoff, but by taking d to be small. Okay. So this integral, under what condition is it ultraviolet diverge? Uh, convergent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How small does d have to be for this to be d minus? D minus. See, so let's go to the large k limit, right? Then this goes as r to the d minus one dr, right? Then 
new monitor. What about the zoom in effect? R to the power two alpha, right? This k square r to the power two alpha. D alpha by r is divergent, right? You have to have this whole thing have a power larger than one. So two alpha minus d minus one to be larger than one. Right? If it's equal to one, you still have divergence, right? So be larger than one. So this tells us that d has to be less than 2 alpha, right? If d is less than 2 alpha, then you are okay. Okay, so this integral can be defined for d less than 2 alpha. Is this clear? So how do we do this integral? So let's assume that this is equivalent. Okay, this you can always assume because you can always make this with and um, perform the integral and do things like this. Then this integral can be written as integral. 0 to infinity, r to the power d minus 1 dr, omega d minus 1. This is the volume integral, r to the d minus 1 dr, because this is a d dimensional integral, omega d minus 1, right, because it's a d minus 1 dimensional sphere, right? If you have a d dimensional integral, you put it as a radial integral and d, d minus 1 dimensional unit sphere. So this is the volume, volume minus 1 dimensional in this case. Divided by R square plus C to the power R. First, let's get rid of this c. So you can define r as square root of c times rho. Okay, I just want to get rid of the c from here. Then the c dependence comes at a c to the power d. Okay, because c to the power d by 2 minus alpha. And then you have omega. I just rewrote this integral in a row variable so that the c dependence uh, just factors out. Okay, because if I write rho r equal to root c times rho, then this becomes a c to the alpha comes out, and you have a rho squared plus 1 to the power alpha in the denominator. And then from the numerator, you have a c to the power d minus, sorry, square root of c to the power d minus 1 and the square root of c. So that we would go to the c to the power d minus 1. Now this integral is divergent if 
he is larger than two alpha. Okay, which is expected because if he is larger than two alpha, then this grows too fast and infinite. Right? And you get the original convergence. But for d less than two alpha, this is integral. See now, the way I have written, this can be made sense of even if d is fractional. Here there is no problem, right? Even if d is fractional, you can make sense of this. So you can calculate this okay, for any d, even fractional d or irrational d, any real d, as long as d is less than 2 alpha. And the answer for this I'll like write down, this you can try to check. This is gamma alpha minus d by 2 divided by gamma. If d goes to 2 alpha, then this goes to gamma 0. Okay? Then gamma, gamma has a pole at 0. So you get back the diagram. Okay, but uh, otherwise, this is uh, an Omega d minus 1. <coughs> if you think of this as a volume of a d minus 1 dimensional sphere, then of course it can be only defined for integer d. Volume of a d minus one dimensional square doesn't make sense for fraction uh, uh, real d, arbitrary real number. But what one can show is that it is possible to rewrite this in a way that can be made sense of an arbitrary d. Okay, just like we made sense of this for arbitrary d, it is possible to rewrite this as an integral where d appears in the integral, okay, not in the form of integrating over d minus 1 variables. If you think of it this way, you have to integrate over d minus 1 variables, right? But it's possible to convert this to a form in which we don't think of this as an integration over d minus 1 variables. D just appears in the, as, a, uh, as an argument in the integral. With that, I'll write down the formula. Okay, maybe I'll uh, give this as a homework problem to uh, do this. That this one has a formula which is Two pi to the power d by two over gamma of d by two. So okay, here I made a mistake. There is a gamma of d by two here. Anyway, this is a standard integral, right? So you can try to do this, or you can try to put it in mathematical and see if mathematical can give the result. This is, you should find that this is the result you get from this. So this, as I said, it is possible to rewrite it in a way by if the, if the integral d as a argument of a function, and this is the result that you get. So let's at least check that this has the right value for known cases, right? So d equal to one. What we expect for d equal to one, omega zero, zero dimensional sphere. One, one. So let's see what we get. Two times d equal to one, right? Root pi divided by gamma of half. Gamma of half is how much? Root pi. Gamma of half is root pi. Why is it two and not one? Zero dimensional sphere. So how are you defining zero dimensional sphere? X square equal to one, right? In n dimensional sphere, right, has x one square plus x two square up to x n plus one square equal to one, right? So zero dimensional sphere should be x one square equal to one. X one square equal to one has two solutions, right? Plus minus one. So a unit sphere in a zero dimensional unit sphere actually has two points. Okay, not one, one, that's why it's two. 
So let's look at d equal to 2. So this is for d equal to 1, right? d equal to 1. For d equal to 2, you get 2 times pi divided by gamma of 1. Gamma of 1 is how much? Gamma of 1 is 1. So this is 2 pi. This is the correct result for one dimensional circuit, right? So for d equal to 3, we get 2 pi to the power 3 by 2 and then gamma of 3 by 2. How much is gamma of 3 by 2? Half, half gamma half, right? So half times root pi. So this is half times root pi. Right? So that gives you 4 pi. That would be the correct results for a two dimensional sphere. D equal to 3 means the corresponding sphere would be omega 2, right? A two dimensional sphere has area 4 pi. You can check that for D equal to 4, you get by a 2 pi square. That's what we said earlier. Anyway, so, but now we are in business, right? Because now you see that everything that we have here is written as an analytic function of D. So now you can think of D as a continuous area. And then eventually recover the lesson by taking D goes to 4, but that has to be done only at the end of all this renormalization process. Right? If you try to take D goes to 4 in the, into, in the mm -hmm. middle of the calculation, you will find the results are diverging. You have to first adjust your parameters, okay? eliminate the M and lambda in terms of these new parameters A and B. And only at the end, if in keeping A and B fixed, you have to take D goes to 4. Is this quite clear? So let me correct on everything and write this. I can write as 1 over 4 basically this 2 to the power d I wrote as 4 to the power d by 2 and this pi to the d and pi to the d by 2 got cancelled and become pi to the d by 2 so, so 4 pi to the d by 2 and then gamma alpha minus d by 2 Now, since part of this manipulation was formal, right? For example, this this made sense only for certain range of alpha, right? Down to a certain range of d. This, for example, I just replaced it by this. There are various consistency checks you can try to carry out. Okay? For example, exercise check that del del c of both sides. What do you mean by this? If we take del del c of this side, 
what will you get? You will get C D D by 2 minus alpha C to the power D by 2 minus alpha minus 1, right? This is just a constant. On this side, if you take del del C, this will become minus alpha times k square plus C to the power alpha plus 1. Right? That integral can be again evaluated by the same formula, right? With alpha replaced by alpha plus 1. So you should be able to check that whatever you get by directly differentiating this, agree with what you get by differentiating this and evaluating by this formula again. So in dimensional regularization, once you have used the dimensional regularization, you can carry out the usual manipulations of differentiations, okay, taking it from outside to inside, okay, as you can see from this formula. Have integrals of the following form 4k over 2 pi to the d by d dk over 2 pi to the d how do we evaluate this? So the point is that for evaluating this, you don't have to go back again and do the integral all over. Okay, from whatever formula I have given here, you can actually calculate this. So the trick is that you first see that this integral, just by Lorentz invariance, and in this case rotational invariance, because you are also in the Euclidean space. In the Euclidean space, by rotational invariance, this is proportional to one. After you do the integral, k integral, right? Yes, this is proportional to theta mu nu or delta mu nu in this case, right? Because uh, we are using Euclidean, okay, let's say theta mu nu, doesn't matter. Theta is delta for Euclidean. Theta is delta for Euclidean. So it should be some constant A times theta mu, right? Now you can calculate A by simply multiplying, taking the case with eta mu, both sides. So if you take the case with eta mu, you know, what is the left hand side? Eta mu times. What is the left hand side? What is the right hand side? Yes? It's D times A. Right? Don't use 4 because we have used dimensional regularity. This is this is the thing you have to be careful about. Okay? That once you are working in d dimensions, right? You should never think about four. Right? Always think in terms of d dimensions. Okay? We'll see that this is not always possible. Okay? And that's where we have some serious trouble. Okay? But right, right now at least you are okay. Okay? So eta mu nu, eta mu nu is d. So d times a. So it's d times a. Right? It's integral. D d k over 2 pi to d 1 over k square plus k to the power alpha. So what do you get here? Eta mu nu k mu k nu? That is k square, right? No d over there. So this is k square, but I can write this as k square plus k minus c. <laughs> so this is integral d d k over 2 pi to the d, 1 over k square plus c to the power alpha minus 1 minus c, sorry, minus c over k square plus c. Okay, I just cancelled one power of k square plus c in the first term. The second term was just minus c over k square plus c. And now the idea is that both of these integrals are all the, of this form. Okay? In the first one, you just replace alpha by alpha minus 1. Right? And then the second one, you just multiply by minus c. Okay, so you don't have to do a new integral. Right? This formula is enough to evaluate that.
Let me give you a few more details and then I'll stop today. So we can ask how to deal with multiple denominators, right? Because this is too simple an integral. Because typical integral, so let's write multiple denominators. So typically you have an integral of the following form. dbk over 2 pi to dt and then 1 over, say, e1 plus a, a plus e1, square plus e1, square, e square. This is a typical term that we have. And in one loop, we have multiple denominators. So the question is, how do we deal with these? Okay, so far you have been talking about only one denominator, right? So what we do here is that we use this formula that if you have one over a one, a two up to a n. Okay, this is what is called the Feynman parameterization. This there is general formula, this, this is n minus 1 factorial integral 0 to 1 dx1 integral 0 to 1 dxn. There is a delta function. This is an identity. You have multiple integrals, then you can show that this is true. This is okay, you can try to check this in simple cases. Take a, a1, a2. In this case, we have two integrals, dx1, dx2, but because of this delta function, okay, there is really only one integral, right? Integral dx1, x2 has to be set equal to 1 minus x1. And then you have a1, x1 plus a2 times x2, but x2 is 1 minus x2. Okay, so now you can do this integral x2, and you can check that this should be 1 over a1. Okay, and this way you can try to verify this for arbitrary cases. So using this identity, what we can do is that we can combine all these denominators together okay, by into a single denominator, but with a higher power. <coughs> so then this integral will write dx1 I'm including the i epsilon right now.
this this is what we are doing first of all i forgot to mention here this p1 p2 up to pn these are some combinations of external moments right okay, that's the way should be think of this so what i'm doing is that i'm thinking of this as a1 a2 up to n in the denominator and using this i write it as x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 up to xn times n to the power n okay this is digital over x in Okay. But now we just have to simplify this. So in the denominator we have j square times x1 plus xn. So x1 is j square multiplies all of them, right? J square multiplies x1, x2 up to xn. But this is of course just one by the way of the delta function. This is one. Then you have k dot plus two k dot sum over i equal to one to n x i two. That is by multiplying so expanding up two k dot p one two k dot p two p dot p. And then you have the rest. So sum over i equal to one to n x i times i squared. Okay, I'm forgetting about I epsilon right now. We can put it back at the end. Okay. But now we can just complete the square. Okay, so I can write this as k plus sum over i equal to one to n i equal to one to n x i p i square. That takes care of this and this, and you have to subtract off minus some i equal to one to n x i square p i square plus some i equal to one to n x i square square. So the i is the i epsilon are always m i. I mean, i epsilon you can always put because m i you can put an i epsilon, right? M i square minus. So this raises to the power. Okay. In fact, once you are doing Euclidean, you don't really need I epsilon. Like I epsilon is needed when you do the <coughs> Lorentzian integral. Okay. Then you have to keep track of it as well. Okay, but now we are done, right? Because this you define as some new variable k prime. And this you call C. So using this, we can write this integral. Is because this whole thing we are calling C, we have got the function of the xi's, and on this now we apply the formula. Okay, 
Okay, so this is the way we <coughs> deal with multiple denominators in dimensional equalization. Right? But we have to evaluate an amplitude which has multiple denominators. Most of the amplitudes are of that kind, right? Like the one that we did here. These are two denominators. Right? So for this n equal to 2, we have to combine it in this, this way to get the n equal to We can see. Yes. Summation yeah. is Summation? Yeah. Is it okay or no? I'm saying that when they put a full square, this is sum over xi pi square, no? Because x1 times p1 square plus m1 First term should be. Oh, yeah, thank you. This should be sum over x i p i equals to this. Because you complete the square, right, and sum over x i p i equals to have this. Okay, so once we have this, we substitute the expression for C, we are evaluated in using dimensional regularization, and then we carry, carry out the x integrals. Okay, often you don't even have to do the x integrals okay, to extract a finite piece. Okay, we can just work at this level. So maybe I'll stop here. Next time we'll discuss a few more generalizations because <coughs> this, for example, is at a level of one loop. Right? We have there is multiple denominators, but only one momentum integral. Typically, we will have multiple momentum integrals. If you have k loops, for example, there will be k momentum integrals, right? So how do we deal with those cases okay, in dimensional regularization? And then we will also have to discuss what to do with the gamma matrix. Right? Because uh, we have to now generalize also the gamma matrix algebra in arbitrary dimension. Right? So there will be not, there will be d gamma matrices, and d in general is not an integral. So you should see what to do with those.